What's up, everybody? Hey, y'all know how we do it here. This is the Thrive Tribe. I want you, if you're excited for the first Thrive of 2023, I want you right now to set, I want you to set the chat on fire. <laughs> I want this chat to be on fire. Hey, we've got a saying in my mentoring and coaching group, Daniel's Den, and uh, we call Daniel's Den a home for the hungry. Um, people in Daniel's Den have a revelation that God is enough, but Sunday is not. Woo! That if I'm going to live my best life, uh, if I'm going to be my best self, if, if I'm going to tap into the John 10, 10 life, then God is enough, but just church on Sunday is not. That my spiritual development is the most important thing. But watch this. It's not the only important thing. Did you hear what I just said? We teaching already. My spiritual development is not the most, is not, it is the most important thing, but it's not the only important thing. You know what else is important? My emotional development. I, uh, I had a thought in my devotional time, today's Wednesday, um, Friday, and here was the thought. You need spiritual intelligence to discover your calling. You need emotional intelligence to accept it. Think about that, guys. Think about that. Somebody put that in the chat right now. We need spiritual intelligence to discover our calling, but we need emotional intelligence to accept it. So my spiritual development is the most important thing, but it's not the only important thing. I need to develop emotionally. Uh, I, I need to develop in my leadership. And I also need to develop relationally. And that is what we're getting ready to talk about until God says something different. <laughs> Tonight, right now, we are starting a Thrive Bible study series called Relational Intelligence. Dr. Darius, why in the world are we starting off talking about relationships? Because I'm gonna share with you a principle I learned years ago that your greatest joy and your greatest pain in life is going to come from the same place. What's that, Darius? It's going to come from your relationships. And I'm gonna tell you something. For many people, relationship management is all about avoiding pain. And I'm not saying that's incorrect, but I am saying that's incomplete. Because biblical relationship management should not just be about avoiding pain. It should also be about accomplishing purpose. So relationship management isn't just getting bad people out of your life. Come on and talk back to me. If I'm teaching already, put teach in the chat. Come on, put it there. Relationship management isn't just about getting bad people out of your life. It's about knowing how to pursue and then nurture the right people when they're in your life. Because the course and quality of my life is not just determined by getting bad people out. Woo! Or people who are going through bad seasons out, right? So let's let's reframe that, right? Let's let's reframe it. So when I say bad people, I'm not making a judgment on the totality of a person, but I'm saying a person who's bad for us in that season. So when I say bad people, I don't necessarily mean bad people. I mean, people who are bad for us in that season. But I can't say bad for us in that season every time. So I got to say it like this. So you know what I mean? So when I say bad people, that's what I mean. So the course and quality of our life is not just based on getting bad people out, getting the wrong people out. Is based on keeping the right people in. Is this good, everybody? So listen to me. We're going to be spending the next several weeks. I mean, I'm going to dig so deep into this. I'm going to dig so deep into this. I'm going to lean into this until I feel like the Holy Spirit is prompting me or giving me a release to come out of it. We're typically pretty scheduled in our teaching calendar. But th with this one right here, I hadn't even given my team what's next because I don't even know what's next yet. Because all I'm thinking about for the foreseeable future 
is relational intelligence because this is the year that you have to get this part right. And as we explore this subject of relational intelligence, we have to deal with some of the other intelligences that impact you, our ability to be relational, relationally intelligent. So it means that we're going to have to dive a little deeper into emotional intelligence. Because if I'm a people pleaser, if I'm hypersensitive, if I'm codependent, all of that affects my ability to manage my relationships in an intelligent way. And when and when you start addressing some of those areas, watch, right? Lord, I don't even have time. Uh, to, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Somebody put in the chat. You got time. I got time today cuz. I got time today. When you start addressing some of those issues emotionally, you experience what I call automatic evolution. What's that? You start changing without trying to change. <laughs> Did you know you could, did you hear what I just said? You start changing without trying to change. It means that you fix one area and then it starts affecting other areas. And so there's an auto, there's an evolution you experience automatically when you increase your emotional intelligence that makes you a different version of yourself. Now the people around you have to learn how to re-relate to you. And this is what I'm praying for, for your life and my life in this next season. If you receive this now, when we say, uh, if you receive this, I'm going to have you some, just put, I receive it in advance, right? <laughs> Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm praying that God sends you people that can handle the evolution of you. Mm. That, that, Cause some people remember now, some people like or love an inferior version of you. I'm praying that God sends people into your life that can handle the evolution of of you, the version of you that you are getting ready to step into. Yep. Some people will, some people won't. You need to be emotionally prepared when that happens so that their doubts about who you are and who you becoming don't become yours. So we're going to dive deep into this, man, starting today with this with this subject on relational intelligence. So um, there's a scripture I want to read before I do. I need your help. I need your help. Our mission is to help is is to help as many people as possible change their life. That, that's our mission. That's what we're trying to do through this ministry. This is why we do thrive, because we know God is enough Sunday night. A Sunday sermon is not enough alone is not enough for you to reach your redemptive potential. So we want to reach as many people as possible. And here's a biblical principle. It's in Ephesians. What you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. So if you help us reach people that matter to God, God will work overtime to reach people that matter to you. See, some people miss their miracle because their miracle is on the other end of simple instruction. Are y'all catching this today? We coming out the gate blazing in 2023. We are, we, it is straight truth. I said many people miss their miracle because their miracle is on the other side of simple instruction. In the book of Kings, a man had leprosy named Naaman. He went to a prophet to get healing. He's thinking the prophet's about to blow on him. <laughs> he thinking the prophet about to throw his coat on him. Right. And I, I'm, I'm not I'm not making fun of any of those gestures. I think God can use anything. The point that I'm making is he's expecting something extravagant. And the prophet didn't even come out the house. He said, tell him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman almost missed this miracle because the instruction in his mind was too simple. I want you to know God can do big things through simple things. Naaman said, all you got to dip. Uh, here it is, old school. If you four it in over, you, you rolling with me here. Dip, baby, dip. If you under, if you under 40, don't even worry about it. You missed that. You have no idea. Butterfly, uh-uh, that's old. Let me see you tootsie roll. You, you, you too, some of you too young for that. You got to Google it, YouTube it. Anyway, he just told him dip. Simple instruction. Because God can do big things through a little thing. So 
Man, what if God doing something significant in your life was on the other end of you simply pressing the like button? What if God doing something significant in your life is on the other end of you simply pressing the share button of you simply letting people know? Yeah. Every Wednesday for the foreseeable future, Dr. Darius is going to use God's word. The Holy Spirit is going to use God's word to help us increase our relational intelligence. Don't miss this, guys. Don't miss this. So I'm going to read a scripture. I'm going to read a scripture here. Because the first example we see of relational intelligence is with God in the garden. So we're going to spend some time here in Genesis. So some some of what I'm going to teach you, guys, this is not a retelling of the book. I wrote a book in 2019. A book came out in 2019 that I wrote called I think it came out in 2020, actually, um, called Relational Intelligence. This is not a rehashing of the concepts in the book. Am I going to use some of those concepts? Yes. But what I'm going to be teaching you is some of the revelation that I've gotten since I've written that book. And I want to spend some time in Genesis and I want to show you some things that I've seen in Scripture regarding God modeling relational intelligence for us. Because if you're going to take your life to another level, you need information. You need right information, right? Whatever area you're ignorant in, you suffer in. Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. You need right doctrine to have right practice. You can't have a good life with bad information. Can't make good decisions with bad information. If you execute the right way on information that was wrong, you'll still end up wrong. You know, if somebody tell you ever been lost and you ask somebody for directions, this is before Apple Maps and Google Maps. Let me see this again for everybody that's 40 and older. Huh? We had to go on something called MapQuest. You don't hear me talking. (laughs) You had to print out your instructions. And sometimes it wasn't always right. But anyway, if you you have you can ask someone for directions and they can give you directions that are wrong. And you can follow those wrong directions right and still end up in the wrong place. Look, y'all got me knocking my phone over. I'm excited today. But here's the point. Here's the point. If we're going to discover how to raise relational intelligence, we need to we need information and we need examples. And so we need information from and the example of the originator of relational intelligence. And that's God. God is the most relationally intelligent being in the universe. And in Genesis chapter three, verse 24, he models something for us. This is about to be hard for some of you to digest. But this season that you are in requires you mastering this skill. I'm going to say that again. This season you are in requires you mastering this skill. Listen to this. Genesis chapter three, verse number 24 says, after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden, a cherubim with a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Here are a couple of things I want you to see contextually here. God has created a space called Eden. He's created a species, humans, Adam and Eve, to steward Eden well. They lived in unbroken fellowship and communion with him. I want you to see something that happened. God models for us the way to manage relationships. Look at me because even in the garden, God set a boundary. He said, everything in the garden is something you can eat from except for one tree. Woo. What is he doing? He's setting a boundary here. He's saying crossing this boundary impacts Maybe not even our relationship, but it does impact our fellowship. So we're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to dig here because everybody write this down. Put this in the chat, please. Relational intelligence requires boundaries. 
My goodness. My goodness. Relational intelligence requires boundaries. Here's the way one writer puts it. She says, boundaries don't protect you from love. It protects you for love. Oh, boundaries aren't just to protect you from people you're in a relationship with. Boundaries protect the relationship from things that threaten the intimacy, the health, the vibrancy, and the closeness of it. You don't, watch this, you don't just set boundaries to create distance. Y'all, come on, this is, I know, I know you may not have thought about boundaries this way, right? Right? Because <laughs> very often when we, boundaries are associated with badness. I'm showing you something with God that's a different ang angle and a different take on boundaries. So boundaries is not just about uh, distance. Boundaries exist not to create distance. Distance. Boundaries exist to protect closeness. It's saying there are boundaries that need to be set because these boundaries actually protect the intimacy and the health of our relationship. So watch this. So people who do not see boundaries through this particular set of lens will feel this way. They will feel like if you love me, you won't set boundaries. When what God demonstrates to us is because I love you, I have set boundaries because I value this relationship. I have set boundaries. Because I want us to, to have a healthy, vibrant relationship, it is necessary for you that I articulate to you what line I don't want you to cross. Y'all miss what I just said. Somebody put some fire in the chat if I'm teaching. God himself did not expect Adam and Eve to automatically understand what line he didn't want them to cross. God did not expect Adam and Eve to get through osmosis. Um, what was a deal breaker for him? God did not expect Adam and Eve to read his mind. So why in the world? Why in the heaven? <laughs> Are we expecting people to read ours? Is this good, everybody? I'm going to tell you something here. Our church adopted a theme uh, this year called multiply. And I believe this year can be the year that you multiply the peace in your relationships, that you multiply the joy in your relationships, that you multiply the intimacy in your relationships. Come on. Come on. But if your relation, if all of that in your relationships is going to go up, somebody put this in the chat. You need to speak up, put it right there. Say, speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up. Watch this. Some of you are upset with people about things you hadn't articulated to them. Good God Almighty, you had, you, you're upset that they're not responding to you in a way or meeting a need or taking, into, taking something into consideration that you haven't articulated to them. And we assume that if people love us, then they will be attentive. And we assume that attentiveness, may, now watch this, let, let, me just, let me just go on and break this down so it can forever consistently be, be broken down. Attentiveness means I will catch some things. Attentiveness does not mean I catch everything. Some things you have to tell me. See, I know, I know, see, see, here's the issue. Come on now, I, can y'all, are y'all gonna be able to handle several weeks of this? Are y'all gonna be okay with this? Because I know what I am teaching, this is the, I'm teaching good news of the kingdom, right? The gospel of the kingdom. And as, as, as I've been praying recently, even over, the ministry God's given me. I'm like, God spread this gospel of the kingdom, which is the gospel Jesus preached. See, Dallas Willard says the gospel of the kingdom includes the gospel preached about Jesus and the gospel Jesus preached. Good God Almighty. The gospel about 
Jesus is the good news of Jesus's actions. The gospel that Jesus preached was the implications of this action. See, I grew up in a church where, and I love this, every, uh, I grew up in a church context, right? The, the, the tribe of churches we were a part of. Almost every Sunday, a preacher would end his message talking about what Jesus did. Died one Friday, hung on the cross, stayed there all day, uh, all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday, early Sunday morning, got out of the grave. That is right. But that's not where the story ends. If that's where the story ends, we would go to heaven, but we would still deal with hell on earth. Why? Because Jesus told his disciples, I not only need to get up out of the grave, I need to go up. And the reason I need to go up is because the Holy Spirit needs to come down. And the Holy Spirit is actually going to empower you, come on here, to experience life as the king intended. Uh, Paul called, when I say king, I mean God. Paul calls the Holy Spirit the earnest. In the book of Ephesians, he says the Holy Ghost is the earnest of your inheritance. What does that mean, Dr. Darius? It mean, that word earnest means a down payment, a title deed. It means that it is a little bit of now what you're going to get a lot of later in heaven. Come on, a little bit of now what you're going to get a lot of later. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we don't have to wait until we get there to experience some of it. The kingdom, God's original intent for the human species, the kingdom, God's rule, reign, and government over all creation, God's kingdom, the king's way, God's way of doing things, what life is like when it's done God's way. The, the, the kingdom is already and not yet. So this, this right here is different than cultural teaching. Th this isn't culture's way. It's the king's way. And that's why it might be a little disorienting for some of us. Because in many churches, what we're hearing is simply, simply a, religi a, a religious version of culture's way. And I ain't even got time to deal with this because some point in this year, I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to deal with this idea of truth and this revelation that I've gotten on lies um, and how uh, how the deliverance of truth is an act of spiritual warfare. Like even the term spiritual warfare, you will not find the word spiritual warfare in the Bible. The concept of spiritual warfare is in the Bible. Paul says it. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Right. So the concept of principality uh, of um, spiritual warfare is in the Bible, but the word itself is not in the Bible. And because the word itself is not in the Bible and an explicit definition of it in the Bible, what happens is people kind of attach their own definitions to the word. So when we think spiritual warfare, we only think exorcisms. I'm telling you, the first example of spiritual warfare is in the Garden of Eden with Satan showing up like a serpent lying to Adam and Eve. So the devil now knows if the truth sets me free, lies keep me bound. And so in the garden, he lies through serpents. Now he lies, he lies through a serpent. Now he lies through culture. He lies through people we like. He lies through books we read. He lies through movies we watch. He lies through music we listen to. And some of us have heard so much of that, that because it sounds good, we think it's sound. So therefore, in relationships, in the movies, if they love you, they just read your mind. I'm telling you, being attentive helps me pick up some things, but I can't pick up everything. That's a movie. That's not real life. <laughs> God himself did not expect Adam and Eve, who were at that moment without sin, They are as perfect as a human species can be. And God still didn't expect an un, 
tarnished, a non-morally depraved human to read his mind. So if God didn't expect a non-morally depraved human to read his mind, why do we expect imperfect humans who deal with a degree of moral depravity to read our minds? They can't. Should some should people catch and know some things? Yes. Are they going to know everything? No. So it means that if I'm going to have relational intelligence, I need to be like God and I need to be willing to articulate on the front end what I need. Woo! I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get ready to stop this. This is a little <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a little different because I, I, I feel I feel some of you. I, I feel I feel you. I feel the energy. Here's the energy. No, 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 no. No, I ain't got time to be telling people if you my friend, you should know if you my woman, you should know if you my man, you should know there's a difference between knowing some things and knowing everything. You should know I was tired. I don't know. You don't look tired to me. You should have you you should have known I wanted you to call me. How would I know? You don't talk that much when I do. God himself did not expect Adam and Eve. <laughs> Y'all, we just go. We're just going to lay foundation today. I can't even I'm not even going to be able to get to, to, to dive deep because this is I, we've got to do some mental disruption today. We've got, we've got to disrupt some concepts about relationships that we have embraced as true that are inconsistent with the example set in scripture by the person who is the ultimate example and expression of relational intelligence. No one manages relationships better than God. I don't care what social media influencer you're listening to. It does not matter what books you read it. It does not matter what movies you're watching. If you are not and I, if we are not learning relational intelligence from God, whatever we're learning about relationships is suboptimal and inferior. And I don't know about you, but I am not in a season of my life where settling is in me. Let's use some bad English, but some good theology. Put it ain't in me. Come on, if that's you, put it in the chat. It ain't in me. I'm just in a season of my life where it's settling is not even in me anymore. If it's suboptimal, I don't want it. If it's less than God's best, I don't want it. If it's less than my best, I don't want it. So why would you continue to accept that in the area of your relationships when you will accept it in no other area? Are you hearing what I am saying to you? No settling. Put that in the chat, y'all. No settling. This is why. Lord, y'all got me. I'm just all over the place. This is why you need. I'm a, I was supposed to talk about this at the end. I'll talk about it both. This is why this year. Some of you have been a part of boot camps and challenges I've done. I do not do a challenge because I don't have anything else to do. I'm busy. I do not spend three nights, sometimes five nights, sometimes six nights doing a challenge because I have nothing else to do. I do it because because I realize and recognize God is enough, but Sunday is not. And this is why this this next boot camp, this challenge that I'm going to be doing, uh, guys, uh, it's starting January 22nd. Uh, 23rd and 24th, a Sunday night, a Monday night, a Tuesday night. It's called dominate your year. Cause settling is not in you. Why endure another year? Somebody put in the chat, not me, not me, not me. I will not endure another year. I will dominate it. 2022 was hard. It had ups and downs. I felt overwhelmed. But at the end of the year, I could look back at it and say, I dominated. God said that you and I have the ability 
to exercise dominion. What does that mean? Does that mean perfection? No. Does that mean without trouble? No, because dominion requires Genesis 126 and 27. You've got to subdue the earth before you can feel it. So it's some stuff that's out of control. We got to subdue. But we don't have to just endure our year. We can dominate our year. And so I'm going to take three days and teach you how to do that, because dominating your year requires you developing you. I'm not talking about being aggressive. Uh, being aggressive is not going to get you what you need in this year. Do we need to be more assertive? Yes, probably. But assertiveness may not be your issue. Your issue may be evolution. Dominating requires you becoming a version of yourself that doesn't exist yet. And the first thing I got to help you do, I'm going to do this on night one. I'm going to do this on Sunday night. I'm going to help you develop. Don't miss this, guys. Why am I talking about this now? Because I guess you need it right now. Um, he, he, I'm going to help you develop. Y'all better catch this. <laughs> I'm going to help you develop the belief to dominate. Guys, this is something I've been in church my whole life. Uh, seminaries, teach at sem taught at seminaries, whole nine yards. I didn't learn until about three years ago that belief is not a result of will. Belief is a result of skill that literally you can be taught the skill of increasing your belief. I would look at people who had greater faith than me and I would think God gave them something he didn't give me. Now, in some cases, people had the spiritual gift of faith. I understand that. But in many cases, people had actually cultivated their belief system. And I didn't even know until a few years ago that you can cultivate your belief system. And it took me, y'all, watch this. I didn't get out of God, but it took me getting outside the four walls of the church to actually get in rooms where people shattered my limiting beliefs and, and, and moved me from a scarcity mentality or from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. I knew nothing about fixed mindset and growth mindset in church. And all throughout the Bible, all God's trying to get us into is a growth mindset. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all you ask, think, or imagine. Why am I talking about this right now? Because you need to hear this. So now I want to help you develop a belief system to dominate. I, I learned it took me getting outside of church because in church they taught me to have faith. They didn't teach me how. They just told me, listen to the word. Faith comes by hearing of the word of God. But when it comes, I got to learn how to keep it. Did you hear what I just said? Because have you ever heard a sermon and it built your faith and you were excited and you were enthusiastic for that moment? And then once you got outside of that moment and outside of that space, you were like something happened and you're like, I'm not on fire no more. <laughs> I'm just uh, if, if that's you, if, 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 if this is real, just put me in the chat. It's like I was amped up. I was excited. <laughs> I was lit. And then all of a sudden it was just like, yeah, I'm not lit no more. Because faith comes through the word. I need to learn the skill of keeping it. So I'm going to teach you how to develop a belief system. Then night two, I'm going to teach you how to develop a blueprint. I ain't talking about this no more. Y'all tired of this. The, uh, but you need a blueprint. How do I become that version of myself? I'm literally going to teach you um, how I do. I'm going to I'm going to teach you my personal growth plan. Like I'm going to I'm going to share with you. Hey, this is what I do on a weekly basis. This is how I grow. This is how I evolve. I'm literally going to I'm going to show you that because here's some of your problem. Some of your problem is you think God gave me something he didn't give you. That's not true. I just know something you don't know yet. And I'm doing some things you aren't doing yet. And I'm going to share that with you and you're going to dominate your year. Now back to relational intelligence There's no settling in us. This is not settling season. So why would you settle relationally? And I'm going to show you this one thing. Because we're just laying foundation here. I want to show, show this one thing here. 
That's so amazing with God. He articulates to Adam and Eve, this is, hey, this is, this is a boundary from, for me. Don't cross this. I remember, let me just give y'all an example of this. Y'all okay if I tell you a quick story? Hmm? Y'all want to get in my business a little bit? Let me tell you a quick story. <laughs> so, I remember, um, I grew up, I grew up, I did not, I was a guy, I didn't have a lot of girlfriends. You know, I guess you just had like a bunch of girlfriends. I just, I never had a lot of girlfriends. I, uh, now I started early now, about, about first grade I had, I had one. This, this was like, um, let me see, you got to be 40 and over. If you're not 40 and over, you don't know nothing about this. Uh, sixth grade, first day of school, Miss, Miss, Miss Smith class. Uh, it's a little girl. I know she liked me. And so I took this little, I took a, I, <laughs> I took a pencil. And I wrote on this paper, <laughs> do you like me? <laughs> then I drew the box. See, y'all don't know nothing about this. You got to be 40 and over. I drew a box <laughs> and said yes and no. <laughs> and gave it a note. <laughs> if you like me, check <laughs> yes. If you don't like me, check no. <laughs> who does that? Who, who does that? Anyway, some of y'all did it too. Here, here's the point. I, I didn't I didn't have a lot of them, but I saw a lot. And then especially when I got to college, I saw a lot. And so I remember when Pastor Shamik and I first started dating. Right. So I think I met her. I was like 19, 20, somewhere around there. We first, I had seen a, I, <laughs> I had seen a lot. And uh, I'm kind of like a low. Uh, I'm kind of a chill guy. It's just like, hey, vibe. Let's just, you know, can't we all get along? You know what I mean? It's just like, ah, uh, we. I'm, I'm like big energy, positive energy, optimism. That's just like my my makeup, right? So, um, I had seen a lot with like a lot of different relationships, and so I remember I sat her down. We. Were, this might have been like right after the first date or something. I was like, oh, oh, maybe first couple of days. I'm like, I'm, I'm feeling her. So. At this point, it's like, I don't even want to get too attached until we get some stuff on the table. Right. I don't want to fall in love with you and then realize you're not for me. That means because if I'm in love now, love is blind. Y'all missed it. So if I fall in love first, the love's going to make me blind. And so now I'm going to try to force something that may not be meant to be. So as soon as I feel like I start catching feelings. I was like, no, let me share. I sat her down. I said, hey, I'm feeling you, blah, 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 blah. I'll never forget this. I said, now, this was going to happen. I said, I'm never going to scream at you. Ever. I said, I said, my dad's never screamed at my mom. I said, so I'm never going to scream at you. Please don't scream at me. I said, I am never going to cut up your clothes or slash your tires. Please don't do that to me. I am never going to call you out of your name. Please don't do that to me. Because those are things that affect me in a different way. Now, this is this is this is where some some people mess up. They will let culture determine what their boundaries are. You can't determine my boundaries. You can't say I'm weak. If I say, don't scream at me, you can't take somebody screaming at you. No, I don't want someone screaming at me. <laughs> That's the difference. And I'm wise enough to know, Hey, I'm not trying to protect myself from the screaming. I'm a grown man. I played basketball all throughout college. I know coaches screamed at me all the time. But what I'm dealing with from a coach is not what I wanted to deal with with my woman. Now, I'm not judging people to scream. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm saying what did Darius do? He articulated a boundary. I'm not trying to protect myself from screaming. I'm setting a boundary so I can protect the relationship. Because I, and I did it. If you hadn't seen this, this video is on YouTube. I did a, a, a teaching on YouTube. I can't remember what we called it, but it's on. It's about love and resentment because t 
two emotions can exist at the same time. You can be in love with someone you have a degree of resentment toward. If they are not giving you, come on, if you're in a relationship and you're not getting what you need, your frustration, frustration and resentment always live in the same house. You can't be frustrated and not deal with a degree of resentment. So I knew if these things happened, even if I didn't leave the relationship physically, part of me would leave emotionally. So I was aware enough to articulate, this is what I need to be fully here emotionally. And that's part of what makes me me. You see that? This is what God did in the garden. He articulated. This is what it is. I remember one time I had a, um, I, it was one of my close friends who's just not really responsive. Like, yeah, just not really responsive. And I remember articulating to him like, yo, we all busy. And I never want you to feel pressure. I don't want me to feel pressure, da 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 da, da. Um, But one of the things, I, you know, that matters to me is if I am in covenant relationship with you, that even when I can't get the response I like, that I at least get a response that lets me know I've been heard. See, why am I getting, why am I telling y'all my business? Why am I, I don't have to tell you this. Why am I this transparent? Because I want you to give yourself permission to see how God has wired you because your wiring, watch this, and the way you've been built is what determines what boundaries you need to set. See, if all, if screaming or whatever doesn't bother you, you don't need to set that boundary because you've been built in a way where that doesn't affect you emotionally. So you can't set my boundaries because you aren't built like me. And I can't set your boundaries because I'm not built like you. But relational intelligence requires the awareness of and the articulation of the things that need to be in place for me to stay here emotionally. And some of us right now are in relationships where you are gone. You just hadn't left. Teach the word Darius Daniels. You are gone, but you have not left. What happened when Adam and Eve, I'm out of here. What happened when Adam and Eve crossed that line? When they violated the boundary. Verse 24, we read it. It says, after he drove the man out. I don't even have time to deal with this, but very often the people that break things in your life or break you rarely take responsibility to proactively fix it. Sometimes uh, are you getting, so God didn't wait for them to get the revelation that there, that there needed to be some distance. It says God drove, he drove them out. He's like, yeah, this is, this is not working. So I'm going to take the initiative to put some space and some distance between us now. I'm not going to wait on, here it is, here it is. You got to speak up. This is initiative, guys. Relational intelligence requires initiative. Somebody put initiative in the chat. God did not wait for Adam and Eve to get a revelation of what was best for him. He took the initiative. Is this making sense? He drove them out and watch what happens. On the east side of the garden, he placed a cherubim with flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. He's like, yeah, I got to put y'all in a, come on now. Let me see if y'all following the thing. If you read the book, you know, the theme of the book, Relational Intelligence, is like put people in their place. 
that different people have different places in your life and some people have different places in different seasons. So God putting them outside the garden of Eden here is an example of him saying now, okay, in this season, this relationship needs to be repositioned. I got to reposition this relationship. See, some people don't have to go out your life. They just got to go in a different place. That's why in certain seasons, somebody that may not, you may not have been close to, you get to a season of your life. And you're like, man, I'm really close to this person. Why? Because they've been repositioned. And then there will be people you were close to in the past. And now you're in the present and you may step into your future and you're not as close to them. Re there's repositioning. So here you see God repositioning a relationship. And then has a cherubim, has something set in place to not let them back in. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that family? It's a boundary. And here's what I'm going to share with you. This is the, this, this, this is the principle we're going to leave with today. Hopefully you got a lot. I hope your head is spinning. I hope you are rethinking some of the things you have believed to be true about relationships. But catch this now. Gosh. Un. Conditional love, which God has, does not mean unconditional access. It's time to go. It's right. Uh, am I in the text? Uh, it's right here in the text. God's like, does God love Adam and Eve any less? No. Is he any less their father? No. Do they still have a father, son, father, daughter relationship? Yes. Is there Relationship changed? No. Has the fellowship changed? Yes. Because you cannot confuse unconditional love with unconditional access. Love is a free gift that must be given, but access is a privilege that must be earned. I almost spoke in tongues right there. I almost spoke in tongues right there. <laughs> I felt the witness of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what I just said? Love is a gift that is freely given. Access is something that's earned. And when I say earned, I don't mean people have to work for it. You have to, you're going to have to work to be my friend. No. When I say earned, I'm not talking about merit. Earn, when I say earn, I'm talking about stewardship. I'm talking about value. And I'm saying in this season, I feel God on this. That you need people around you that value the access to you. See, when people get you, they get a whole lot. Come on. And you need people around you that have vision enough to see the value that you bring to their life. And you want to see the value that other people bring to your life so you can steward those relationships. Well, we're going to talk about this later in the series, but it's also a principle, a foundational principle of relational intelligence. Relational intelligence rests upon the foundation of a plethora of principles. And here is one. We are all equally valuable in the eyes of God, but not everybody adds equal value to you. This is one thing I really try to get uh, people in the entrepreneurial, specifically the knowledgepreneur space to wrap their head around. It's like, yeah, as a person, you are equally valuable in the eyes of God. Never confuse that with the value of what you bring to the market. Who you are in God has nothing to do with how the market values what you offer. <laughs> it's, it's not the same. You know, I think teachers, no, I'll use a different example. I think like teachers, police, I think all public service, it's weird. They do the most important work. This is how backwards culture is. They do the most important work. They are the least compensated. I remember I grew up in Mississippi teachers that I uh, some of my teachers in Mississippi literally work two jobs. It's sad. It makes no sense. They are educating our children. And there are many of them are doing it because they have a calling because you can't even do it without a degree. 
So they have gone to school, some of them taken out student loans to educate our children that many of us did not want to be with every day from nine to five. I know that's your little baby, but you know, <laughs> you see, you know your baby. Now imagine 20 of them. Every teacher need a raise. <laughs> need your salary doubled in Jesus name. But what's the issue? The issue is those of us that are making decisions regarding teachers, those that are making decisions regarding teachers' salaries aren't valuing that properly. Hope I'm making sense here. I want you to value you. And I want you to manage your relationships in a way where those that are closest to you are those who rightly see you. Do your friends see you? Whoever you're dating, do, do, do they see you? Gosh, I'm going to talk about this. We are going there this series. We're talking about relational intelligence with family. We're talking about relational intelligence with dating. Because some of you are dating people who lust after you, but they don't admire you. I told, I told my, my oldest son, son, if you don't admire her, don't marry her. Because when you admire her, you treat her different. Now, you need to like her, too. Now, that's that's something. That's, <laughs> you know what you like. <laughs> but get what you are attracted to and what you admire. Yeah, you want your friends not to kiss up to you, but to it, to it, to see you properly, to admire you. And I'm praying God does that for you this year as you steward your relationships. Well, now listen to me. Increase only comes from stewardship. Got me faithful in least faithful in much increase only comes from stewardship. So if you and I, will steward anything well, God will increase it, right? Steward your money well, increase. If you, stu this is the year, you steward these relationships well, watch how they increase in your life. I'm telling you something that I see in the Bible, but I'm telling you something I am living. I am living this. I literally was with, I was at dinner with someone I'm not going to say his name. If I say his name, all of you would know who he was. Every single person you would know who he was. And he was talking to me about my team. And he said, how did you get, how you get these people? And I looked at him and I said, ain't nobody that good. Nobody that good to have this kind of team. Ain't nobody that good at what they do to have this kind of team. Because whenever you, whenever you got good people, good people always got options. See, some of y'all miss, you just miss what I just said. If anybody's good at what they do, they got options other than you. So they with you because they choose you. They with you because they feel called to you. And this is what I said. I said, here is my wife and I's for biblical philosophy. If you will be good to people, God will always send you good people. Did you hear what I just said? And all throughout my, my ministry, all throughout my journey, God has tapped people on the shoulder, like, like the Macedonian call with Paul, go over there, help him. <laughs> God, see that's who did it? God did. God has tapped people on the shoulder, said move, pick up, move and help because if you will be good to people, watch this. And if you are good with people, God will always send you good people. I need you to receive that. And I need you to make a commitment that this is the year you're going to dominate in your relationships. You're going to dominate your year. And so if you are not 
if you if you if you missed this, I was supposed to talk about this uh, right now. <laughs> but uh, but if you have never been a part of any challenge or any boot camp that I've done, uh, you got to get in this one. I've done one called Rock the World with Words to help people get better with speaking. Um, I've done one called Unleash Your Calling. This one right here, though, is called Dominate Your Year. It is January the 22nd through January the 24th. Listen to me. It starts 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every night. It is me. I'm the special guest. I'm the guest psalmist. I'm the guest musician. I'm the guest. It's, it's me and Jesus. I'm going to spend three days helping people develop a belief system to dominate their year and develop a blueprint to dominate. If you will do what I say over these next, well, over the next three days of the challenge, January 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, if you will do what I say, listen to me, if you will do what I say, you will leave that challenge with a plan to experience a quantum leap in your personal growth in 2023. Because I, lit I literally created, it's called PD's personal growth calendar. You literally get to see what I do every day to grow. Some of you think I'm reading every day, all day. I ain't, nope. You, you, you get ready to see, I live my life like Chick-fil-A. I got a day, I don't do nothing. The principle of the Sabbath. I'm, I'm literally gonna walk you through some of the stuff that I read and then walk you through how I read. I read to feed, not to finish. If the book ain't helping me, I'm too old. To, I'm too old to read a book that ain't helping me. I say, oh, I got all I can get out of this. I'm done. I'm literally going to walk you through that and teach you how to how to how to how to schedule it. Like you, 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 you need an attitude to dominate. That's your belief system. I'm going to help you with that. You need an action plan. That's that. That's a blueprint. And then you need assistance. I'm going to share with you where to look to get some of the things done that you need to get done this year. Some of you feel, see, God gives you a lot of what's. God doesn't give you a lot of how's. Your how's are in the who. Did you hear what I just said? God can tell you, God will tell you what to do. He doesn't give you a lot of instruction on how to do it because the answer to how to do it is in a who. It's in somebody else. I'm going to teach you how to identify the who's that can help you dominate. I remember in one season of my life, I had one kind of coach. It was like a life coach. And I'm not perfect at life. But once I got to a degree of mastery, I was like, oh, I don't really need anybody to help me organize my time anymore. I kind of got that. Not perfect, but I got it. I need a think coach now because now I need to I need somebody to help me think about what I'm thinking about and then help me think about some stuff I don't know to think about. It's like I need a thinking partner. <laughs> right. So different seasons require different kind of assistance. Some of you in a season, you don't need a coach. You need a friend. So I'm going to walk you through that 630 to 730. Now, that's for general. VIP, admit, VIP, I, I flipped that. I used to do VIP first and then general last. I'm going to do general first, 630, 730. Then we'll take a little 10-minute break or so. Then I'm going to do VIP, and I'm going to get on a Zoom with everybody in VIP. That way you can ask me questions about what I just taught in general so you can implement it into your life immediately. I'm taking what I've learned in decades and I'm condensing it into days. I've been, to, been into spiritual development and personal development about 20 years. I'm taking decades and condensing it into days. You can register for this. I'm pushing this with everything in me because I believe in it like nothing else. Love you. So proud of you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. This Thrive community who sows seed into into giving. Generosity giving is not a law. Tithing is not a law. It's a principle. Praise ain't a law. It's a principle. Come on. It's a principle. Serving is not a law. It's a principle. And so here's the principle, man. Is reciprocity. Let him who is taught in the word communicate or share in all good things to the one that is teaching. 
So if a ministry, a, a church or a parachurch ministry is blessing your life with that which money cannot buy. As you are able, give as you've been prospered, as you are, as you are able, you should sow back into the field that you're harvesting from. It does a few things. One of the first things it does is it demonstrates to God that you value what he's giving you over some of the other things you invest in. And what does that do? That causes God to go to work to make sure that the word that you're hearing is actually implemented and actualized in your life. Because without God's help, everything I, you can have a, a tablet full of notes that you will not be able to execute without God. You cannot do anything I taught you. I don't care how clear I tried to make it. You can't do anything I taught you tonight without God. You can't. It won't happen. Can't happen. Won't happen. So I want you to keep that in mind as you sow into this ministry today, whenever you, whenever you're looking at this, as you sow into this, into this ministry, some of you practice, uh, uh this principle regularly, some periodically, but I'm encouraging you to do that grateful for you in Jesus name. So pray and blessing on you. Thanks for being a part of this thrive tribe. We're going to see you next week with part two of relational intelligence. We're just going, we're going in and we ain't coming out until God say so. See you next week. Hey, I want to thank you for watching and I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right. If this